Section 1 of The Revolutions of Civilization by W. M. Flinders Petrie, DCL, LLD, FRS, FBA, author of Personal Religion in Egypt Before Christianity, Egypt and Israel, Arts and Crafts of Ancient Egypt, etc. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings from the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. The Revolutions of Civilization. Chapter 1. The Nature of Civilization. 1. The Meaning of Life. The meaning of life has, in all ages, been the goal of human thought. The search for the causes and effects of the changes that man has undergone has laid the foundations of his religion and his philosophy. The solutions of the different problems have been inaccurate as they are varied, nor could any better results be expected from the very insufficient acquaintance with the past. The last fifty years have greatly extended our knowledge of history, and we stand on a very different footing to all those who in earlier times have dealt with the position of man. While formerly nothing could be learned that was not in written record, handed down from generation to generation, we now handle manuscripts that last saw the light when Rome ruled. We read the records that were compiled thousands of years before the father of history, and we know how to reconstruct the unwritten past for the many other activities and products of human work. It seems, therefore, that the time has arrived when we may begin to take some general outlook over the history of human nature. Our material for observation is far greater than others have had. Our method is more developed since we have learned that comparison is the principal, or almost the only, useful line of study. Can we then extract a meaning from all the ceaseless turmoil and striving and success and failure of these thousands of years? Can we see any regular structure behind it all? Can we learn any general principles that may formulate the past or be projected on the mists of the future? Hitherto, the comparatively brief outlook of Western history has given us only the great age of classical civilization before modern times. We have been in the position of a child that remembers only a single summer before that which he enjoys. To such an one, the cold, dark, miserable winter that has intervened seems a needless and inexplicable interruption of a happier order of a summer which should never cease. Overleaf and illustration is displayed. 1. The Grave Steel of Hegesol, Athens. Only a few years ago, a writer of repute deplored the mysterious fall of the Roman Empire, which, in his view, ought to have been always prosperous, and never have fallen to the barbarians. He was the child who could not understand the winter. 2. Intermittent Civilization From what we now know, it is evident, even on the most superficial view, that civilization is an intermittent phenomenon. When we look at Greek art, as in the exquisite grave steels, Figure 1, then at the decay before the time of the barbarian invasions, as in the figure of Bilica, Felicia, from the catacombs, figure 2, and then again at the splendid sculpture of the 15th century, as in the San Giorgio of Donatello, figure 3. The intermission of art is obvious. We therefore need to compare the various periods, to see what they have in common, and to gather what may be taken as the type of them all. Further, when a longer view, we can trace in the East several intermissions. We may say that civilization is a recurrent phenomenon, as such it should be examined like any other action of nature. Its recurrences should be studied, and all the principles which underlie its variations should be defined. Figure 2 is displayed on the following page. The Grave Steel of Belica, Rome. Figure 3 is displayed on the following page. San Giorgio by Donatello, Florence. 3. Sculpture of the Definite Test We need to look at some of the features of the complex mass of interests which are grouped under the name of civilization, in order to make accurate comparisons. We should only be confused if we contrast things differing in their nature, such as Egyptian construction, Greek poetry, and medieval self-denial. Though sculpture is only one, and not the most important, of the many subjects that might be compared throughout various ages, yet it is available over so long a period in so many countries and so rarely presented to the mind that it may be well to begin with that as a standard subject for comparison and afterwards look at other activities. 4. The Great Year We have used the simile of summer and winter for the growth and fall of civilization. 
This analogy of the great year was familiar to the ancients. In the east, Berossus, the Babylonian, writes of the summer and winter of the great year. In the west, the Etruscans also spoke of the great year as a period of each race of men that should arise in succession. When the Roman great year of 1,100 years came to an end, in the turbulent time of Sulla, 87 BC, we read, One day when the sky was serene and clear, there was heard in it the sound of a trumpet so shrill and mournful that it frightened and astonished the whole city. The Tuscan sages said that it portended a new race of men, and a renovation of the world, for they observed that there were eight several kinds of men, all differing in life and manners, that heaven had allotted to each its time, which was limited by the circuit of the great year, and that when one race came to a period, and another was rising, it was announced by some wonderful sign from either earth or heaven, so that it was evident at one view to those who attended to these things, and were versed in them, that a different sort of men was come into the world with other manners and customs, and more or less the care of the gods, than those who had preceded them. Such was the mythology of the most learned and respectable of the Tuscan soothsayers, Plutarch and Sulla. Apart from the innate belief in divination, we see the broad idea which the Etruscans had of history, that each successive race had its period of a great year, in which it sprouted, flourished, decayed, and died. And the simile is the more precise as there may be bright warm days in winter, or cold times in summer, and there are always irregular fluctuations of weather. So in the course of each civilization there are similar variations, but they do not prevent our recognizing the broad outlines of its summer and its winter. End of section 1《Revolutions in Civilization》by Flinders Petrie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 2 The Periods of Civilization. To learn what the nature of any recurring phenomenon may be, we should examine the longer series of its revolutions and see what they have in common. In Egypt we can trace the past of man in continuous history for over 7,000 years, and can put in order a prehistoric age which may well extend our view to about 10,000 years. Over the whole of that time we know what were the products of every century. In that long range of vision we can discern eight successive periods of civilization, each separated by an age of barbarism or decline before and after it. Here then the discoveries of the last 20 years have put in our hands a series which is sufficient to enable us to compare periods together and learn what they may have in common. We shall here denote these periods by Roman numerals 1, 2, 8, and the stages in other countries which may be contemporary will bear the same numbers. 5. The First Period Prehistoric Apart from the Paleolithic Flint Age, which cannot be treated consecutively, the beginnings of the continuous civilization of Egypt is seen in the shallow circular pits which each contain a body doubled up, with a goat skin thrown over it, and a simple pot and saucer at its side. Shortly after this stage a variety of pottery appears, all of the same materials, among which are red cups and vases decorated with white cross lines, like the modern Algerian ware. This painted pottery gives us the best material for observing the changes of the age, as it is fairly abundant, and has been already classified into several stages by its relations with other kinds of pottery. We see in the earlier examples of this pottery, figure 4, the careful imitation of basket work lines, and the central circle on which the basket was built. In the middle stage, the circle is dropped. The decoration has almost freed itself from the basket origin, and has become a clear and independent design. A Maltese cross which springs between the arms. In the late stage, only an unintelligent degradation of the basket pattern has survived. Thus, in this remote age, there is proof of the rise of ornament from natural imitation, the development of it as pure ornament, and its decay into unintelligent copying. A few remains of this age of any artistic bearing do not suffice to trace a regular sequence like this in other materials. But the general style of the pottery was rising in character and variety for some time, and the work in hard stones and flint was later developed. The connections of this age are with the West, in the style and decoration of the pottery. Figure 4 is displayed on the page 
Growth and decay of patterns on white slip poles. Egypt, first period. 6. The second period, prehistoric. A new order arises with various eastern connections. Almost every kind of product was changed. The order of pottery ceased to develop new types and only lingered on in decay. By its side, a course of style appears with entirely new decorations in red. Stone vases change from tubular to barrel shapes. The forms of flints, of slate parts, of ivory working, and the material of beads all start afresh. The burials are all single, instead of two or more together, as in earlier times. Throughout this later time, a continuous decay may be seen, figure 5, which we can illustrate by the forms of slate palettes, degrading from the tortoise or fish into a senseless outline, and the rise and decay of flint working, which was the special art of this age. The degradation of all the products down to the close of the period is very marked, not only in those here illustrated, but also in the abundant pottery, which became coarse and rough without any artistic feeling. 7. The Third Period Zero to Second Dynasties The distinctive art of Asia begins to appear shortly before the First Dynasty. Hieroglyphic writings was being rapidly developed from an ideographic stage, and we can see the rise of a bold, naturalistic style of sculpture. The archaic stage is seen in the vigorous figure of a warrior, figure 6, carrying his standard and flourishing his double-headed axe. By the time Amena was founded the First Dynasty, the carving was emerging from the archaic, though not yet free. Figure 5 is displayed on the following page, growth and decay of flintwork and slate animal figures. Egypt, Second Period. The head of a king in limestone, figure 7, is of this age, or slightly later. By the Second Dynasty, decay had set in, and the bad proportions and pose of the red granite figure, figure 8, are quite out of keeping with the work of the previous dynasty. For a more consecutive view of the changes, we may look at the series of royal hawks, figure 9, emblems on the king's soul. They are enlarged here, and therefore detail is not to be looked for. The eight at the beginning are of the eight kings of the first dynasty, the other four of the second and third dynasties. The first figure, the time of Mena, hardly attempts the characteristics of a hawk, in the second figure, the form of the wings and the shape of the head have been seized. In the third figure, the type is at its best. The points of the bird are fully grasped, as in the detail of the marking near the eye and on the neck, the feathering the legs and the gripping claws. The fourth observes these points, but in the artificial style of a copyist. The fifth and sixth rapidly deteriorate, and further on, there are only fluctuations of decay, the latter ones even losing the form of the head and copying the type as mere routine. These hawks serve as an example of the rapid rise, the current changes and long decay of art in the first three dynasties. The degree of correctness of these drawings corresponds very closely, reign by reign, with the work of the royal tombs of the kings and the general products. The third figure comes from the largest and finest tomb, the sixth is from the worst tomb, even inferior to those that follow. Illustrations displayed on the previous page 7. Study in limestone of early king, best period. 6. Prehistoric warrior, slate palette, archaic. 8. Granite figure, decadent, second dynasty. An illustration is displayed on the previous page. 9. Growth and decay of hawk figures, Egypt in the third period. The best hard stone vases are the middle of the dynasty. The softer stones are commoner at the close of the dynasty while stone vases are much scarcer in the second dynasty, and in the third only soft alabaster is found. In every respect, therefore, the beginning of the first dynasty is archaic. The early middle is the finest age, and from that onwards there is only a little fluctuation in the decay. The sculpture of the early third dynasty in Sinai is the rudest there, and is unspeakably worse than the excellent figures from the first dynasty. 8. The Fourth Period Third to Sixth Dynasties. The now arises the great age of the pyramid builders. At the close of the Third Dynasty, the rise of the art was probably as rapid as in the First Dynasty. There is an interval of only 130 years in the list between the king, whose work is the worst, Neturkat, and the almost perfect art of Sneferu. Unfortunately, we have no examples definitely dated to the rise of this art, but we can see the remains of its archaic period in the portrait of Queen Mertitefs. Figure 10. 
the careful working of detail separately without treating it as part of the whole to be blended together is the essential mark of archaism the well-known head of nefert figure eleven must again appear as the earliest figure of the pyramid age which is perfectly free in execution an example of the relief sculpture is shown in the vigorous design of the boatmen figure twelve in contrast to this we see how the arts sank in the early part of the eleventh dynasty by the figure of antifa figure thirteen every stage of gradual decay can be traced through the intervening age figure ten is a split on the page queen metadeths cairo figure eleven is a split on the page princess neferet cairo these changes in the art agree with the state of the architecture it rose to its greatest accuracy of work and boldest handling of immense masses in the generation which saw the statue of Nevert, and from that point there was continuous decline. The buildings were less in size and inferior in work, until in the sixth dynasty the mass of the pyramids were merely of loose rubble. In the rest of this period, no pyramids are known. The small brick ones in the eleventh dynasty rather belonging to the rise of the next period. As Mr. Griffiths has remarked, the age of engraving monumental inscriptions had deteriorated greatly as early as the Sixth Dynasty all over Egypt, even in the centres of civilization. From the Sixth to the Eleventh Dynasty, the barbaric stele present many extraordinary attempts to render the half-forgotten signs in detail. With the monumental revival at the end of the Eleventh Dynasty, the knowledge of hieroglyphs revived. Petri Dendere, 53. Figure 12 is displayed on the previous page, Fight of the Boatmen, 5th Dynasty, Cairo. Figure 13 is displayed on the page, Antefa, 11th Dynasty, Dendera. 9. The 5th Period, 7th to 14th Dynasties. This period opens with a minute attention to detail, much like the archaism of the pre-Persian sculptures in Greece. The varieties of growth can be best seen in the sculptures from Dendera, and as a well-advanced example is a tablet at Marseille, figure 14. The rise of this new art was rapid up its full beauty in the 12th dynasty. The 11th dynasty may have occupied at most two centuries from its first princedom, and the old style lasted well until its early stages. Probably the whole rise occupied only a century, and certainly not more than a century and a half. Under Amenemhot the first, the most delicate low relief was in use, as in the head of Min shown here, figure 15. The hard modelling and bad proportion of the 11th dynasty head has developed rapidly into the most refined relief. By the latter part of the 12th dynasty, there was a manifest decline, as for instance in the head of Anemhot the third, here given, figure 16. The continuous series of scarabs shows the same decline, finest and most perfect under Sinusert the first. They steadily became coarsened down to the end of the dynasty, and those of the 13th and 14th dynasties show a continued decadence. The best sculpture of the 13th dynasty kept up some of the earlier style, but was weak and formal, as in the figure of Neferhotep. Figure 17. The latter stages of this period are lost in the darkness of civil confusion and decay, finally closed by the Hyksos invasion. Figure 14 is displayed on the page, head of Hoteptur, Martial. Figure 15 is displayed on the page, head of Min, Univ, Kol, London. Figure 16 is displayed on the following page, Amenemhat, III, Cairo. Figure 17 is displayed on the following page, Defen Hotep III, Bologna. Figure 18 is displayed on the following page, Fresco of Dancers, 17th Dynasty, Oxford. Figure 19 is displayed on the following page, Head of Statuette, Turin. See Archaic, 7th period, figure 39. Figure 20 is displayed on the following page, De Hutmes III, Basalt, Cairo. Figure 21 is displayed on the following page, Remesu II, Red Granite, Luxor. 10. The 6th period, 15th to 20th dynasties. This age is the best known owing to the profusion of remains, especially at Thebes. Of the archaic stage, one of the most vigorous examples is the scene of dancers, figure 18, which resembles the coffin paintings of the 17th dynasty. In the 18th dynasty, there were several stages with different styles. At first, a delicate and ingenious type prevailed, especially on the statuettes, as in the head here shown, figure 19. 
the foreign conquests which brought in Syrian influence changed the type. The best example of its portraiture is that of Tahutmes the third, figure twenty, and after his time greater riches in material and variety of colour was reached, but with a less decided style. The great break of the naturalism of Akhenaten, and the revulsion from it, closed the dynasty. After that there was only continuous decay, as seen in the latter sculpture of Ramesu the second, figure twenty one. 11. The Seventh Period, 21st to 33rd Dynasties. The scarcity of statuary prevents our seeing the lowest stage of the new period. The statue of Amenardes, figure 22, has, however, some heaviness and lack of proportion, which afterwards disappears. The 26th Dynasty excelled in portraiture, such as the basalt head here shown, figure 23. Its reliefs, though without the real vitality of the old kingdom which supplied the model, yet show considerable grace and ingenious design, as in the row of bearers carrying farm produce. Figure 24. The depth to which this art sank may be guessed from the head of a Roman statue, Figure 25, which is by no means the worst of its kind. Greek and Roman art was so incongruous to be a prop to Egyptian design, and the old style passed away for ever. 12. The Eighth Period, the Arabs. How base the style became is painfully seen by the Coptic sculpture, figure 26. The influences upon it were the decayed classical and the Persian art. And it is curious how the geometrical style of the Arab art is anticipated in the straight lines and mechanical curves of the Coptic figures. Figure 22 is displayed on the following page, head of Amenardes, Cairo. Figure 23 is displayed on the following page, basalt head, Louvre. Figure 24 is displayed on the following page, youth and maids with offerings, Cairo. Figure 25 is displayed, Roman statue, Berlin. Figure 26 is displayed on the following page, early Coptic head, University, Cole, London. Figure 27 is displayed on the page, Bab el Futul, AD 1087, Cairo. Figure 28 is displayed on the following page, Portra Sultan Hassan, A.D. 1358, Cairo. Figure 29 is displayed on the following page, Porch of Kate Bay, A.D. 1480, Cairo. The Muslim, abandoning all animate forms, cannot be judged in the same manner as the workers of earlier periods. We must turn to his architecture for comparisons of style. The early work, as in the citadel and fortifications of Cairo, might almost pass as one with the Norman which was contemporary with it in Europe. The gate of Bab el Futu, shown here, figure 27, was built in 1087, the period of the Tower of London and Maling Abbey. Further comparisons see chapter 4. The squares of pattern on the arch follow in pairs on opposite sides, but without any repetitions on either side, just as in the pairs of mosaic bands along the walls of the cathedral at Montreal. Note the grand reliving arch, high above the gateway arc, coming down to the full-blown period of the 14th century, that of the decorated style in England. We see, figure 28, in the porch of the entrance of Sultan Hassan's Mosque, 1358, the development of elaborate bracketing around the recesses to contract the span sufficiently to throw a safe arc over it. The relieving arc has shrunk to a useless band of masonry. Next, the decay of this design is shown, figure 29, in the gate of Cape Bay. 1480. Equivalent to the perpendicular style, where the noble deep recesses is flattened out to a surface decoration. The bracketing has changed to mere superficial pendentives, and the decadence is evident. We have now seen how we can trace through eight successive periods the repeated growth, glory, and decay of art in Egypt, indicating the revolutions of civilization through some 10,000 years. End of section 2. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Section 3 of Revolutions of Civilization by Flinders Petrie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 3 
the periods of civilization in Europe. 13. The fourth period, the early Cretan age. This period was contemporary with the fourth period of Egypt, and is the earliest that has yet been clearly disentangled in Europe. The remains parallel to the first three periods in Egypt still lie in the twenty-one feet of Neolithic ruins at Knossos. This death is a greater amount of accumulation than at which contain the ruins of the subsequent three periods of the early, middle, and late Cretan ages. I have to thank Dr. Evans for assigning the relative periods of many Cretan remains which do not appear in his printed classification, and for supplying several illustrations. Illustration is displayed on the page 30. Objects from Tholos of Hagia Traidea. Of the early Cretan age, the most important examples have not yet been published. Those found at Moklos. It is hardly practicable to show the growth and decay of art clearly from the published material, and we therefore only give here the remains of the Tholos tomb at Hagia Traidea. The seals, figure 30, are primitive in style. The two dogs of leaf patterns are the best work here. The wavy band is apparently the earliest stage of the spiral patterns which dominate the art of Europe in later periods. There is also an elaborate wavy band pattern on a similar plaque. The figures are like those of the Egyptian prehistoric age, period 2, having no arms and the legs ending in a point. They show the earliest rise of figure carving. The well-known Greek island figures from the Cyclades belong to this age. Illustrations displayed on the previous page. 31. Polychrome vase, Gnosis. 32. Faience, goat and kids, Gnosis. 14. The Fifth Period, the Middle Cretan Age. In the Fifth Period, the main feature is the development of brilliant polychrome painting on the vases, and the broad designs of noble curves, figure 31. The period begins with rude figures of men and fishes, and the founding of the first palace at Gnosis. There is a steady growth of naturalism. And at the close of this period, there is the shrine of Nosos, with the goddess holding snakes. There is also the beautiful group of the goat and kids, figure 32. Both of these examples are wrought in coloured glaze ware. A general catastrophe entered this period. 15. The Sixth Period, the Late Cretan Age. We here reach the period of art which is the rival, if not superior, of the Classical Age. The level of which it sprang is seen in the fishermen of Phylacopi. Figure 33. There, though the drawing is crude, the sense of action and vitality of it is full of promise. The splendid steatite vases, with reliefs of figures, soon flow on this. How the figure painting developed is seen by the magnificent figure of the vase bearer, figure 34, and the other spirited frescoes of that time. The masterpieces of the gold cups of Vafiol, with the scenes of bulls, figure 35, show the greatest amount of spirit. The bronze vases have beautiful leaf patterns embossed around them. The pottery vases have paintings of tall lilies life-size, which remind us of the finest Florentine work. The architecture was grand and elaborate, as seen in the great palace of Nosos. Illustration is displayed on the following page. 33. Fisherman. Phylacopi. 34. Vase-bearer. Nosos. But all this splendour suffered a sudden catastrophe in the Dorian invasion. The remains of the style lingered on in some places, as seen in the grave slab from Mycenae, figure 36, and the Cypriot vest painting of a chariot, figure 37. Those centres which were not occupied by the Dorians, as Cyprus, and some cities on the mainland such as Athens, retained the decaying forms of their old arts. Illustrations are displayed on the following page. 35. Bulls on Gold Cup, Fefior, 36 Grave Steel, Macane, 37 Chariot on Vase, Cyprus. 16. The Sixth Period, Classical. The rise of a new art began to dawn in the Diffion vases. The rich spirals of the old art gave way to fret patterns, and geometrical rectilinear decoration and motives take the place of the free design of forms in action. Fresh styles of architecture arise, and Asiatic influences supply the new motives. The figures are stiff and formal, as in the head, probably of Athena, who appears inciting Perseus to the decapitation of Medusa. This metope of Silenus, figure 38, is of the early part of the 6th century BC. A century later, the sculpture had advanced to its most expressive stage, 
and almost its highest technical perfection, as in the statues of maidens on the Acropolis at Athens. Figure 39. To this succeeded the perfect freedom of work in the figure of the piping maiden, figure 40, upon the end of the third of his throne, and the steel of Hegesho, figure 1. The great mass of Greek sculpture gradually fell off from this standard during several centuries. The next come the still lower Roman copies of Greek work, of wearying banality, until we reach the stumpy, clumsy figures of the age of Constantine, figure 41, or the still coarser outlines from the catacomb tombs, such as that of Belicia, figure 2. 17. The Eighth Period, Medieval The northern immigrants brought new ideals with them into the Mediterranean world, and an entirely different style arose, which in its vertical lines and lengthy figures recalls the pre-classical work of Italy and the attenuated style of Celtic animals. An example of an early stage, A.D. 1139, is a scene of an exorcism in Boston bronze on the gate of San Zeno at Verona, figure 32. The bishop and a monk are holding the arms of the possessed woman, from whose mouth a devil is jumping out. This is the parallel in this period to the Selenius designs in the previous period. A century later, the newly perfect work is reached of the Ecclesia at Bamberg, figure 43, which should be compared to the similar stage in period 7, shown in figure 39. The last trace of archaism in this overlaps the age of the most perfect sculpture as seen in the head of the Emperor Henry VI at Bamberg, figure 44, about 1245 AD. How much Europe afterwards deteriorated is painfully seen in all the later sculpture, until in Elizabethan or Jacobin times we reach such productions as the alabaster effigy of Robert Dudley at Warwick, figure 45. Nor was this decline peculiar to the examples. Compared to the figures of the English queens, that of Eleanor, figure 46, queen of Henry II at Fontevrault, with its archaic smile and arrangement of drapery, dates about 1190. By 1290, there is the exquisitely graceful figure of Eleanor of Castile at Westminster, figure 47. The statue of Anne of Bohemia has retained the grace of expression, but the dress has become stiffer by 1395. While Jonathan of Ver, figure 48, shows much more formalism in 1415. Illustrations are displayed on the previous pages. 38. Head of Athena, Selenius, Palermo. 39. Head of Maiden, Athens. 40. Piping Maiden, Ludovisi, Throne. 41. Triumph of Constantine, Rome. 42. Scene of Exorcism, S. Zeno, Verona. 43. Ecclesia, A.D. 1245, Bamberg. Compare 7. Archaic, figure 39, and 6. Archaic, figure 19. 44. Kaiser Henrik VI, A.D. 1245, Bamberg. 45. Robert Dudley, Warwick. In the series of brasses, the same decline is very familiar, though the series does not begin early enough to show the archaic stage. Perhaps the most perfect in design is that of Joan de Cobham in 1320, figure 49, and for the grace of attitude and the flow of the drapery, this is unsurpassed. Descending a century, we meet with the stiff lines, bad anatomy of the arms, and formal expression of Lady Bagot in 1407, figure 50. Yet another century later, in 1512, the style has become entirely stiff and wooden, as in the brass of Anne Astley, figure 51, with the swaddled twins in her arms. And another century, by 1605, we have passed out of all the traditions, and reached an age of trivial externals in the figure of Aphra Hawkins, figure 52. The same degradation appears on the seals of the kings and others. Perhaps the most perfect artistic feeling on any seal is seen in that of Simon de Montfort with the hunter at full gallop blowing his horn, and grabbed about 1240. By the 15th century, the designs with great seals have become heavy, formal, and badly proportioned. Thus we see in every branch of sculpture and engraving how the latter part of the 13th century was the turning point when complete mastery was attained, and how continual was the decay after that time. The Renaissance was but the resort of copying an earlier period, owing to the decay and loss of the true style of the 8th, or medieval age of art. The history of copying, good, bad, or indifferent, does not concern us here. Copying is an artificial system which has no natural development or root in the mind, 
and which browses indifferently on anything that may be the fashion of the day. Illustrations are displayed on the following pages. 46. Eleanor, Queen of Henry II. Fontevrault, 1190. 47. Eleanor of Castile, Edward I, Westminster, 1290. 48. Joan of Navarre, Henry IV, Westminster, 1415. 49. Joan de Cobham, 1320. 50. Lady Bagot, 1407. 51. Anne Astley, 1512. 52. Afra Hawkins, 1605. Section 4 of Revolutions of Civilization by Flinders Petrie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information on a volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 4 The Fluctuations. 18. Egypt and Europe Contemporary. The many recurrences of civilization in Egypt and in Europe, which we have observed, suggest the question as to how far these changes are contemporary, that is to say, in the same phase at one time. To take the most recent age, we may compare some of the best-known buildings of the 8th period. Two columns are displayed on the page with East and England. The massive fortifications, Cairo Gates, 1087 to 1091, Tower of London, 1078, Newcastle, 1080. The beginning of lighter style. Cairo Citadel, 1183. Dome of the Rock, 1189. Canterbury Choir, 1180. Lincoln Choir, 1186. End of Good Enrichment. Mosque of Sultan Hassan, Cairo, 1362. Trinity College, Cambridge, 1350. Gloucester Choir, 1350. Overloaded Decoration. Pendentives. Tomb of Cat Bay, 1474, Palace of Yeshbed, 1476, Crosby Hall, 1470, St. George's, Windsor, 1476. It will be seen that, even as far apart as Egypt and England right across Europe, the developments of the two architectures were as nearly contemporary as we can estimate them. There is certainly not a century of discrepancy. In the seventh period, it is difficult to date the Egyptian position, for there are very few dated sculptures after 1000 BC, until we reach Ptolemaic times, when Greek influence prevailed. The new style was beginning by 600 BC, was drawn by 550, and had developed by 525 at the Persian invasion. On the Greek side, the architecture was strong before 600 BC, Corinth, Salinas, and fully developed by 500, Agrigentum. Though sculpture did not well develop till 500, or lose its archaeism till 450 BC. In this period, therefore, the Egyptian phase was half a century or a century before the Greek phase, doubtless due to the much larger amount of older models known to the Egyptian. In the sixth period, the archaeism disappears in Egypt about 1550 BC. A freestyle is reached by 1500, and decadence is clear by 1300. At Knossos, the highest point of this period is at the close of the Second Palace which, by its Egyptian connections, was about 1500 BC, and the Tel el Amarna pottery of 1370 BC belongs to the decadence of Crete. Here we may say that there is not a century of discrepancy in the phase of the two countries. In the fifth period in Crete, as its middle stage linked with the middle of the 12th dynasty in Egypt, and from the time of its decadence there comes a statuette of the 13th dynasty. The phase was therefore the same within two or three centuries, but the material does not define the connection closer than that. For the fourth period, the latter stage of it in the Crete is linked, by the seal patterns with the 6th to 8th dynasties in Egypt, and the third period in Egypt has pottery, which seems to have been imported from Crete, where it is found in the sub-Neolithic, or stratum immediately on the Neolithic level, and before any palace buildings. The first and second periods of Egypt are yet to be sought in the 25 feet of ruins of the Neolithic Age at Knossos, or 15 feet at Phaistos. Thus it seems that the phase of the wave of civilization was identical in Egypt and Europe to within a century, where it can be observed in three periods, and that in three earlier periods it was generally connected and may have been identical. The Mediterranean and Egypt as a whole formed, therefore, a single group in the history of civilization. 19. Length of period. The length of period thus shown by the sculpture is next to be considered. 
Here the question of early chronology comes in, which has been fully discussed this year in historical studies, British school in Egypt. I shall therefore take it as there stated. No valid reason has yet been given for abandoning the history written by the Egyptians, which is strongly supported by external evidence at each stage, and was accepted by all the other Egyptologists. The best defined position in the development of art is the close of the archaic age in sculpture, when a perfect harmonising of the several parts is first reached. This is independent of personal taste, which may prefer this stage, or the archaic rather before it, or the full-blown glory rather later. We may take the close of the archaic at the following dates. 8th period, A.D. 1240, interval 1690. 7th period, B.C. 450, interval 1100. 6th period, B.C. 1550, interval 1900. 5th period, B.C. 3450, interval 1300. 4th period, B.C. 4,750, interval 650, third period BC, 5,400. Thus the average period is 1,330 years, the shortest about half that amount, and the longest half as long again. 20. Curves of Egyptian and European art. We can now give some appreciation of the waves of art in the successive periods, figure 53. Figure 53 is displayed on the page, waves of art in Egypt and Europe. It is, of course, a more or less personal matter how far certain periods are to be ranked on the same or on a different level, but the judgment of it is very constant, as my estimate made eleven years ago, and not referred to since, is almost identical in height of curves and in form of rise and fall, except in one or two details which later discoveries have added to our knowledge, and in the addition of the waves three to five on the European side, which were then quite unknown. The upper curve at the beginning shows the fluctuations in the Egyptian art. The third period, first dynasty, intermediate in quality between the fourth and fifth periods, fourth and twelfth dynasties. Its art is as good as the fourth period, much better than the fifth, but its architecture is inferior to either. The sixth period, eighteenth dynasty, is rather inferior in every way to the fifth. The decadence from it scarcely rises up to the seventh period, the whole excellence of which is derived from copying. The eighth period, Arab, which has no sculpture in Egypt. It is impossible to assess, except by the general artistic products of architecture and metalwork. Judged by these, it may fairly be put as equal to the 7th Saitic period. There is another way to compare these periods. The crest of one wave is on the same level as part of the decline of another wave, and the art of the two points should be equivalent. For instance, the highest of the 5th period 12th dynasty is equal to 800 years down to the 4th period, or the middle of the 5th dynasty, and this seems fair. Similarly, the highest of period 3 is equal to 300 years down period 4, or the beginning of the 5th dynasty. Period 6, 18th dynasty, is ranged as equal to 150 years down period 5, or the middle of the 12th dynasty. Similarly, the Sait period 7th is reckoned equal to that of Ramesses II. This may be a low estimate of it, but as all the good work at that date is only copying, we can hardly rank it higher. The lower curve at the beginning is that of European art, which rises to be the higher at the end. As all architecture and sculpture since 1500 has been mere copying and playing variations, without any continuous natural development, the last four centuries are omitted as being very variously appreciated. For my own part, I should regard this eighth period as a decline like the others, without taking into account an entirely artificial archaistic revival of the last fifty years, which has no root in the feelings of the majority, and will die like all mere fashions. No doubt in Hadrian's time they worshipped archaistic Minervas as the revival of beauty. All this, however, is only a personal opinion which I do not care to defend. The medieval wave, eight, is here ranked as intermediate in values between the Macanian, 6, and the classical 7. Such heads as Henry the Lion at Brunswick, A.D. 1227, and the Emperor Henry at Bamberg, 1240, are more perfect expressions of character, free of conventionality, than anything which the Macanian age can show. They are fairly equal to the best portraiture of the first century B.C., and accordingly the crest of the medieval wave, 8, 
is put as equivalent to 50 BC. The Mycenaean wave, 6, is put at the level of the Antonines, and it is impossible to equate work so much differing in feeling, but we could scarcely say that it was equal to either earlier or later work. The depth of degradation of the chariot on the Cryptiot face, figure 37, is certainly below anything in the 8th century AD. By 600 BC, there was a considerable rise, as in the Salinas Meteps. By 550, almost perfect work was reached, and it is hard to choose between 500 and 450 for the best. The fall of classical work was uniformly continuous, from about 400 BC to AD 200. At each century, the work was distinctly poorer than that of a hundred years before it. The rapid descent comes later, after Commodus or Severus, as best seen on the coinage, and the coinage also shows how AD 600-800 was a bottom of all in art. In the rise of medieval art, Henry I, 1135 at Rochester, is below Mycenaean art. Henry II at Fontrevault, 1190, is a great advance, showing only a little archaism, and by 1240 the crest is reached. Such are the grounds for judging the form of the waves of the best known ages in Europe. That the medieval was but little below the classical level may be seen not only in the heads of figures 43 to 44, but also in the technical work of drapery. Where we may compare the finest Greek example, the Nike 54, with the advancing work of figure 55, and the fully wrought figures of the death of the Virgin, figure 56. These examples form an instructive comparison of the treatment of thin and thick draperies. Illustrations displayed on the previous page, 54, Nike tying sandal, Athens. 55, S. Philip, early 12th century, Halberstadt. 56, Death the Virgin, mid-13th century, Strasbourg. The earlier periods, 3, 4, 5, in Europe are only sketched in the diagram. Their values are scarcely comparable with others, since there is no figure sculpture and the vast decorations stand by themselves. Moreover, we know nothing yet of the depth of the decay between these waves. Section 5 of Revolutions of Civilization by Flinders Petrie This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 5 Relations of Different Activities 21. Subjects in the Eighth Period so far we have only looked at sculpture as being the most fully represented and most readily valued product of civilization but it must not be thought that it is the most essential product or that other activities have necessarily the same phase of wave as we find in sculpture most of the other evidences of civilization appear later than that of sculpture and our object in this chapter is to estimate the order in which they are evolved and their relation one to another we begin naturally with the best known period, that of the last six centuries, and examine the changes in that before looking to earlier periods. The great and important elements of moral ideas and religion are omitted here, because they are so largely subjective, and their standards necessarily vary with the requirements of the phase of the civilization. Sculpture and architecture go closely together in all ages, so far as we can see. In sculpture, the turning point of freedom has been here set at A.D. 1240, mainly on the strength of the well-dated Bamberg sculptures, which are remote from Mediterranean tradition. In architecture, Salisbury Cathedral stands for the perfect acquirement of freedom and grace without the least trade of over-elaboration, as it was founded in 1220 and completed without the steeple before the consecration in 1258. This coincides as closely as possible with the highest point of sculpture. We are here following the test period of the disappearance of archaeism, apart from the personal question of appreciation of style. The next development is that of painting. Some of the drawings by Matthew of Paris, about 1240, are very beautiful, such as the royal marriage, M. S. Scott, Nero, D. I., but yet not of archaism. There is no work of Giotto that is beyond the archaic stage, down to 1330. The chapel of S. Felice at Padua shows that as early as 1379, complete freedom was attained by Altichelio, and Jacopo di Avanzo. They were the earliest masters to stand clear of archaism, which is not fully passed by other men till about 1450. We may say, then, that the turning point in painting is 150 or 200 years later than that in sculpture. 
in literature we must compare only plain prose as poetry and plays have by their nature an artificial structure bacon and ben jonson are the turning point bacon with his high education retained the archaic structure while jonson shows that in popular use archaism had gone and many of his sentences might have been written at any later date sixteen hundred may then be taken as a turning point of freedom in writing and none can deny that it was the greatest age of vigour in literature in music the development is so much nearer to our own time that it is difficult to estimate it impartially perhaps we may say that hayden was still archaic in most of his life but steps freely for the first time in his great symphonies of seventeen ninety while beethoven only shows some memories of archaism rarely in his earlier symphonies from seventeen ninety six onward hence perhaps seventeen ninety may be accepted as a turning point our difficulty of estimation is still greater in later developments in mechanics or the adaptation of long familiar principles and materials the full freedom of design was clearly not attained in the earlier railway work brunnell's tubular bridge though new was by no means a perfect adaptation to its requirements perhaps baker's fourth bridge may be the typical example of freedom from needless restriction in meeting one of the oldest needs of man with methods and material already well known apart from fresh discovery or it may be that further work will show that archaism has even clung to that for the present we may put down eighteen ninety as a close of archaism in mechanics it is obvious that in natural science discovery is still flowing rapidly and that our conceptions have by no means outgrown the stage of casting off previous ideas and only developing what is in hand material wealth is also still rapidly on the increase we can now summarize the turning points of the freedom from archaism in the eighth period as being at a d 1240 in sculpture 1400 painting 1600 literature 1790 music 1890 mechanics after a d 1910 science 1910 wealth 22 subjects in seventh period the estimation of the dates of these several phases in the previous civilization of the classical period is next in our view the sculpture we have already estimated as reaching the turning point at 450 bc painting was of later development but in the absence of any dated paintings of pre-roman times we can only glean a view from the vague descriptions and remarks preserved to us polygnotos 460 bc whose style was strictly ethnic seems to have been almost parallel to giotto in design the establishment of light and shade and abandonment of flat tents is attributed to Apollodorus, 400 BC. Zeuxis, by 400 BC, scarcely adopted correct proportion. By about 350, Parhoesis and Eupompes, with his direct appeal to nature, seem to have finally left archaism. Apelles appears to have belonged to the latter full-blown age, the Raphael of his period. In Italy, there is flat tint painting of high quality from Paestum, probably before 400 BC, for soon after this date the Greeks were conquered by the Lucanians. The more advanced paintings of Fulci and Cornetto cannot be dated by history, but there is nothing on this side discordant with the development in Greece. We may take then 350 BC as a turning point of archaism in painting. In literature, the close of the archaic style and development of complete freedom of structure and adaptation of the sentence might perhaps be put between thucydides and xenophon say three eighty b c in greece in italy on the contrary it was later and can hardly be put before cicero fifty b c we may adopt the mean date of two hundred b c in music our knowledge is almost entirely of its theory and not of its history or development and practice so it is useless to try to judge its evolution from archaism the mechanics of the Greeks continued without a break into Roman use. Demetrios Polyorchids, so 300 BC, greatly developed machines for siege purposes. Diode, 25. His great siege tower is 150 feet high, but such a structure does not demand as much resource and ability as the erection of obelisks. Those which Augustus erected were 78 and 71 feet high, that of Caligula, 83 feet, and that of Constantius, 105 feet. To set up such masses seems to prove a greater amount of mechanical facility and structure than is shown by any other Roman work. 
This skill was continued into the lower empire, as seen by the obelisk at Constantinople. In construction, the greatest dome, that of the Pantheon, 140 feet across, dates probably from A.D. 120. The Basilica of Maxentius, A.D. 310, is only 85 feet across the nave, and, vast as the whole is, it can hardly rank as a bolder work than the Pantheon. The date of full mechanical freedom may thus perhaps be put at the beginning of the first century, with a continuance scarcely abated till the fourth century, since both mathematical and organic continued to develop into Roman times. Strabo's Introduction to Geography, A.D. 20, is excellent in its geometry and its scientific spirit. By Ptolemy, A.D. 150, as a geometer and theoretical astronomer, and as a vast organizer of material in geography, gave the final freedom to these sciences. The enormous works of Galen, A.D. 180, did much the same for medical science. It seems doubtful if there was any advance in knowledge after A.D. 200, and within one or two centuries later, ground was certainly being lost. We may take A.D. 150 as the point of freedom of thought from archaic hypothesis. In observing wealth we must either select the maximum of precious metals, or the maximum of invested capital of conveniences of life. There are facts very scanty, and the result must be more a general impression than a divine statement, yet the two stages must be kept apart. Alexander plundered the accumulated treasures of the eastern world in Prussia, and Rome gradually stripped the Greek world of all its wealth by conquest and taxation, as well as drawing largely from Gaul and Spain. Probably the first or second century AD saw the greatest accumulation of gold, Certainly, after Aurelius, A.D. 170, there was a sudden drop in the weight of the Aureus, and there was no reign, with a free coinage of gold except Servius Alexander. This points to the capital stock having been mainly exhausted by A.D. 170, probably by the prodigious waste in gilding during the first two centuries. The drain of buying off the barbarians came later. The maximum of precious metals might, then be set somewhere in the first century, say, A.D. 50, before the gigantic waste of Nero's golden house. The accumulated capital of the means and conveniences of life probably continued to grow to the beginning of the breakup, about A.D. 200. But in the less disturbed provinces such as Britain, Egypt, and Syria, we can see the most widespread prosperity later, about A.D. 300, as shown by the principal abundance of buildings and settlements of that age. The turning points of the civilization of the seventh period may then be stated as follows. B.C. 450 in sculpture, 350 painting, 200 literature, 0 mechanics, A.D. 150 science, 200 wealth. 23 subjects in the sixth period. Of the sixth period we can only judge in detail from Egypt and the distinctions of succession in Greece are too slightly known in the Mycenaean age. Sculpture, as we have noticed, passed from its last trace of archaism about 1550 BC, early into the reign of Amenhotep I. Painting was fully free and natural by 1470 under Tahutims III. Of literature, there are few datable remains. Akhenaten's great hymn to the Aten seems fully developed in its structure and noble use of language in 1380, while the poem of Pentor in 1290 is turgid. In the tales, the taking of Joppa, 1470 BC, is but an artless folk tale. The doomed prince, about 1300 BC, is well composed. Anpu and Butta is as fully developed as any writing of this period, and can hardly be later than 1200 BC. Perhaps 1350 BC may be taken as a date of the first freedom in style. In mechanics, the largest masses cut and erected were the Colossi of Ramesu II at Thebes and at Tunis of 1,900 tons. These were made about 1280 BC. Of science, we have no detailed accounts. The wealth shown by the diffused comforts of life seem to have grown down to Ramesu III. 1180, and magnificent objects are shown in the tomb of Amadua, about 1140 BC. There certainly was a decline after this. The summary then stands for the sixth period as BC 1550 in sculpture, 1470 painting, 1350 literature, 1280 mechanics, 1180 wealth. 
24. Subjects in the fifth period. For the fifth period, our data are still more scanty. The sculpture freed itself of the rise of the 12th dynasty, 3450 BC. Painting was certainly free in the figures of the wrestlers at Beni Hassan, late in the reign of Senusert I. The burial of Ben in his 43rd year, 3396 BC. Of literature, the best example is a hymn to Senusert III, about 3320 BC, and the adventures of Sainhat were very probably written about this time, referring to persons of two or three generations earlier. Mechanically, the greatest work known is the cutting and placing of the quartzite monolithic tomb chamber of Amenemhat III, 3270 BC. Of wealth we have little idea, but it certainly increased down to the close of the dynasty about 3250 BC, but probably not later. The summary of the fifth period then is BC, 3450 in sculpture, 3400 in painting, 3320 in literature, 3270 in mechanics, 3250 wealth. 25. Subjects in the fourth period. In the fourth period of the pyramid builders, the scanty data point to the following stages. Sculptures emerged from the archaic by 4750 BC in the reign of Sneferu. Painting seems to have been a little later, as the geese of Neflamat may be a generation after the tomb of Rahotep. The mechanical ability is difficult to distinguish from the purely architectural maximum. For accuracy on a large scale, Khufu stands unapproached, but the flint paint slab of Asa is the most highly finished piece of work in this period. We know so little of the history of literature or wealth in this period that we cannot hope to estimate their exact position. The summary of the fourth period is thus. B.C. 4750 in sculpture, 4700 painting, 4650 mechanics. In these last three periods, it may well be said that we are trusting to only one or two examples of some subjects that happen to have survived. But it must be remembered that it is the work of the fullest age that is most likely to survive, and it is the literature of the principal age that is most valued and copied. We may now receive all the stages of civilization together, taking the earliest phase, that of sculpture, as the zero of each period. The table is displayed on the page, comparing sculpture, painting, literature, mechanics, science and wealth to the periods of the 8th, 7th, 6th, 5th and 4th. Thus in the order of the development of the successive phases of each period is usually the same, though the intervals lengthened in the latter ages. Section 6 of The Revolutions of Civilization by Flinders Petrie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 6 The National View of Civilization. 26. The Highest and Lowest Conditions. The comparison of the successive periods may usefully be made by defining the greatest feature of each period in Egypt or Europe, and the nature of the collapse at the close of each period in Europe by conquest. The table is played on the page comparing the greatest feature to the collapse in Europe. Greatest feature column reads 4. Power of Construction, 4th Dynasty, 5. Foreign Connections, 12th Dynasty, 6. Utilization of Natural Products, 18th Dynasty, 7. Cataloging of Nature, Roman, 8. Utilizing natural forces, modern. Collapse in Europe column reads as Extermination of the conquered, destruction of mayors only, slavery, Dorians, taking share of property, North races. We can thus see that the widening of the outlook in the summer of each period, and the amelioration of the collapse in the winter, this is the real nature of human progress. 27. The period in other continents. So far we have only regarded the Mediterranean and European civilization, which is the same phase throughout, but this is not necessarily the phase in other parts of the world. In the Euphrates and Tigris system, there was always a strong civilization, which seems to have begun in the highlands to the east of the Great Valley. The Mound of Susa accumulated 26 feet in 4,000 years, and if the 50 feet of rain below that grew at the same rate, that would imply a beginning of 12,000 BC. If it only grew at the rate found in Palestine mounds, then it dates from 6000 BC. Probably we have to deal with a culture as early as any traced in Europe. 
We cannot here distinguish the phases exactly as we can on the Mediterranean, and we must merely state the most notable rulers from the artistic point of view in each period. In Etum, B.C. 4450, years 700. Naram Sin, 3750 B.C., 1650 years. Kamarubai, 2100 B.C., 1460 years. Ashurbanipal, 640 B.C., 1460 years. El Mumam A.D., 820. The first of these periods is quite uncertain, as there is nothing to show whether such a stage was not attained earlier. The average of the three defined periods is 1,520 years, which is not far from the 1,320 years average on the Mediterranean. By the time which the Eastern period anticipates the Western is. A table is displayed on the page, comparing East, West, and the difference with an average of 365 years. Thus, the eastern phase, on the whole, keeps about three and a half centuries in advance of the Mediterranean, varying from two to five and a half centuries. These results give some insight into the general meaning of historical conditions. The impression that civilization always comes from the east is due to the east being a few centuries ahead of the west in its phase. Thus, on the rise of a wave, the east is more civilized, or on the fall of a wave which does not attract attention, it is less civilized. The cause of the constant struggle between East and West is likewise seen to be due to the difference of phases. In Mesopotamia and Europe, where, in the same phase, there would be a balance of power, as there is around the Mediterranean, when even a political incidency does not involve a change of population. But with Mesopotamia always leading, it is bound politically to overrun the West a few centuries before the rise of the West in each period. The Mediterranean was almost an Arab lake at the time of El Muman. Persia dominated all the civilized Mediterranean in the 6th century BC, yet on the whole the West more usually controls the East, because from the time of its maximum, during the gradual decline of each period, it is always on a higher plane than the East. In some other cases, also the period from one wave of greatness to the next can be traced. In India, Asoka had the greatest power known in ancient times, including all India, except the southern tip, Kashmir, Afghanistan, and Baluchistan. This rule was at its height in 250 BC. The next great age of rule was on the completion of the Mongol Empire, AD 1550. The interval is 1,800 years. In Mexico, the highly civilized Maya kingdom is traditionally stated to have been founded in the 10th century BC. On its fall, it was succeeded by the Toltecs, also highly civilized, in the 6th century AD. The interval is 1,500 years. Thus, the period of a civilization is Mediterranean average, 1,330 years, or admitting the earliest, 1,500. Mesopotamia average, 1,520 years. India, one period, 1,800 years. Mexico, about 1,500. It is evident, therefore, that the length of period is practically alike in different parts of the globe, suggesting that it is due to the human constitution rather than to external causes. The phase, however, varies greatly. 28. The phase belonging to folk, not to land. Here another inquiry must be made. Does this phase in each place belong to the country or to the people? The only way we can study this is by seeing examples where a whole people have migrated and expelled a race which has a different phase. Does this subsequent history agree with their own old phase, or with that of their new country? We cannot take any modern movements, as we cannot yet see what may be the phase of the immigrant civilization, and in early times we do not know enough of the sources of nature of immigrations before the classical period. The large northern movements are out of count, as the northern seem by their exquisite early bronze work to have had the same phase as the rest of Europe. The few movements which we can examine are those of the Etruscans, even Asiatic people, the Greeks in Bactria, and the Arabs in Spain. The most curious feature of the Roman history is the disappearance of the civilization of Etruria. The Etrurian sages themselves put their period as 1,100 years, ending at 88 BC, in the passage which we have quoted in the beginning. Their great civilization, shown by engineering works, great fortress cities, and richly painted tombs, 
all vanishes before the imperial period, when Rome was greatest and Italy was most secure, and had the fullest opportunities for development. Etruria is absolutely a blank page. Cisalpine Gaul, the plain of Lombardy, has some political importance and produced some important men, but not so Etruria. We must see that the Etruscan civilization was in a phase that was some centuries before that of Greeks and Rome. The source of the Etruscans has been endlessly debated, but they certainly were foreign to Italy, and as foreigners they brought with them a phase of civilization which was not that of the Mediterranean or of Western Europe. Of the Greeks in Bactria we know little, but certainly for some three or four centuries they show a civilization which was higher than the native. Now the East was highly civilized. Persia was far more advanced than Greece at 500 BC and probably at 400. For the Greek, therefore, to retain a superiority to the Eastern implies that he kept his own phase, which was two or three centuries later. The Arabs in Spain are strangely neglected in current histories. To write of medieval Europe without them is to ignore the principal civilization of the period. The fullest histories, the strongest literature, the largest life, were all self the Pyrenees throughout the Dark Ages. Yet this civilization occupies five lines out of five hundred pages in the best-known handbook of that period. We read in the Arab historians of different kings having elaborate gardens with every variety of plant, of the literary academy to whom new poems were recited, of the fund for the endowment of learned men and the attraction of scholars from all parts of the world. The crowning glory was the library of Al-Hakam, who in 970 AD entirely filled a palace at Kutoya with books sought from the whole known world. The classified shelves of the library held 600,000 volumes, all catalogued and in order. The political power was rather earlier, as its greatest extent was when Abder el Rahman reached the middle of France in 732. When we look further, we see that by 1030, they deplore the rapid deterioration of the people, and by 1144, a democratic system began, setting up and overthrowing rules with great frequency by the power of the vox populi. This regular feature of a decaying civilization shows that it had certainly passed all its stages of growth and glory. These states of political power, literature, and decay entirely conform to the Mesopotamian phase, and are contrary to the European phase. Thus, apparently, in the case of the Etruscan in Italy, and of the Greek in the East, and certainly among the Arabs in Spain, it is seen that the phase of an intrusive people is that of their source, and not that of their new religion. The phase of civilization is inherent in the people, and is not due to the circumstances of their position. When the phase of each group of civilization has been further defined, it may be possible to use the phase of civilization as a criterion of the source of an invading people. The instance already noted of the Etruscan phase illustrates this. The greatest power was about 600 BC, which was that of the phase of Mesopotamian civilization. Possibly the phase clings to a race of ages. Certainly the most flourishing period of medieval Tuscany was earlier than that of the rest of Italy by a few centuries, just as it had been earlier in the classical times. In connection with this, it may be noted how the conquest and settlement of each country of Europe by Rome is reflected in its later history. The order of Roman influence was Italy, Spain, France, England, Germany, and this is the order of political power of these countries in the last few centuries. 29. The Breaks Between Periods The next question is that of the separation of one period from another. We have represented the wave of civilization as falling to a minimum, and then suddenly rising again. To what has this change due? In every case in which we can examine the history sufficiently, we find there was a fresh race coming into the country when the wave was at its lowest. In short, every civilization of a settled population tends to incessant decay from its maximum condition, and this decay continues until it is too weak to initiate anything when a fresh race comes in and utilizes the old stock to graft on, both in blood and culture. As soon as a mixture is well started, it rapidly grows on the old soil and produces a new wave of civilization. There is no new generation without a mixture of blood, but thanogenesis is unknown in the birth of nations. Further on, we shall deal with some of the natural results of this condition. 
We will now review the breaks between the periods in Europe and in Egypt to show the reason for the broad statement just made. The movements of peoples always extend over some centuries. We can only adopt the dates at which the actual race mixture seems to have occurred. The break between the classical and medieval periods, 7 and 8, is the most familiar. It is needless to detail here the continuous flow of migrations from the north of Europe to the south and from the Asiatic side westwards. Between AD 300 and 600, 15 different races broke bounds, blowing to half a dozen different stocks. See Migrations, Huxley Lecture, 1906. And here take 450 AD as a main date of mixture, though much was going on for two centuries before that and also after it. The beginning of the classical period, 7, and the close of the Mycenaean, 6, has been partially understood from recent discoveries. The old tradition of the turn of the Heraclidae is placed about 1200 BC. The Cretan civilization is supposed to have been swamped during the Alliance Wars on Egypt, 1194 BC. The Egyptian connections with Greece by dated objects all cease at this date. Hence 1200 BC may be taken as a date of the main change. The breaks in the Middle Cretan, 5, to the Late Cretan or Mycenaean, 6, and from the Early Cretan, 4, and the Middle Cretan, 5, were at approximately the dates of the breaks in Egypt, but cannot be otherwise dated from Greek sources. In Egypt, the change from period 7 to 8 is particularly definitely fixed by the Arab invasion in 641 AD. After the main body, other tribes of Arabs came in, down to the 9th century. On the other hand, there had been a filtering before the Great Migration, as Arab horsemen were Roman auxiliaries in Egypt and many centuries earlier. The break of the sixth period is not well defined in Egypt, but was made up of various immigrations starting the seventh period with Easterners, 950 BC, Ethiopians, 750 BC, and Libyans from then onwards. The sixth period was brought in by the Chyskos migration, 2600 BC, and had been a filtering in of Eastern people before, and two Mesopotamians even became kings of Egypt. Also, there was probably a constant flow of further immigrants, as exemplified by Terra and Hebrem, about four or five hundred years later. Probably we might date the mixture of Hyksos as beginning about 2600 BC. The fifth period is indicated by the collapse of Egyptian work after the Sixth Dynasty, at the appearance of the close of the Sixth Dynasty and onwards of foreign button seals, which are connected with Cretan products 4000 BC. The fourth period, of the pyramid builders, apparently began in the third dynasty. There is continuous decline in work down to the close of the second dynasty and early in the third. Yet by the end of the third dynasty there had arisen the finest Egyptian art. The break indicated by the change of dynasty is doubtless the coming in of the new period. This is dated at 5000 BC. The rise of the third period is lost in the darkness of the pre-dynastic age. The highest point of the sculptor we have shown by the hawks to belong to Zer, 5400 BC. Before that, there was 150 years to the beginning of the first dynasty and 350 years of kings before that, dynasty zero, making 500 years recorded before the age of the best sculpture. But this is only the time of a settled rule, and the duration of the confusion of the conquest has to be added, perhaps a century more. The invasion dates, when a new period of civilization is started, may can be compared with the sculpture phases thus. A table is displayed on the page comparing period with invasion, the growth, and sculpture. It is obvious that the pyramid builders came in upon the early dynastic people abnormally soon, taking only 150 years to rise to a fresh maximum. We know so little of the historical conditions that we cannot see the meaning of this. Perhaps it should be rather regarded as a double maximum of one period, divided in the same way as the classical age was parted to a Greek and a Roman maximum. 30. The Diagram of Periods We are now in a position to review all the dates for the various phases of each period in a combined diagram. See figure 57 at the end. Each period is shown by a line sloping down toward the right hand. The scale of the period runs along the line as marked in the bottom period, and the line slopes down according to the vertical scale ruled in millennia. Thus each line of a period ends at the same level as the next period line begins. 
These period lines may be looked on as a continuous spiral around a cylinder, divided at each invasion. The purpose of thus arranging the facts is to enable all the periods to be readily compared in their main features. There is no absolute fixing of the successive lines of periods one below the other. Many different adjustments might be made, and one must be arbitrarily selected. The rise or close of each period, the ends of the period lines, are not satisfactory, for a period may come to an abrupt break, as did the six. None of the phases of a period are so well defined as the close of archaism, the attainment of complete freedom in sculpture. The latter the period, the more the various phases diverge, and it is not well to place the earliest of the phases in a vertical column, as the other phases will spread so far to the right in later periods. The fairest arrangement for comparison seems to be to take the best defined phase, the sculpture, as a connecting link, and to set the sculpture phases one below the other in a line square with the slope of the period lines. The earlier periods are necessarily based upon the Egyptian examples, and the latter periods upon the European examples, as being the best defined at each case. So much for the construction of the diagram. Now we turn to reading the diagram and drawing conclusions from it. The first striking feature is a much wider spread of the phases as the periods descend. This means that there are lesser intervals of barbarism between the civilizations, and that the civilization phase in each period is longer at each recurrence. This is in accord with the common idea that the world is getting more civilized as the ages go on, in spite of the crushing fact that in many kinds of civilization the successive recurrences show no improvement. Egyptian construction is as good in the fourth period as anything done in the four latter periods. Art is as good in the fourth, or a sixth, or a seventh, as it had ever been later, though differing in its nature. Thus, while the best work in art is no better in successive periods, the total amount of civilization is greater because it is longer. The gain is in quality and not quality. Another result of this widening out of the phases is to separate the best period of each form of culture. Thus, in the early days, the arts of sculpture and painting, mechanics and wealth, were all nearly contemporaneous. Hence, there was artistic mechanics executed by wealth. But as the phases space out further, the art is decadent before the mechanical ability is free, and before the wealth has grown. Hence, the increasingly tasteless use of wealth by the late Mycenaean, the Roman, or the modern man. A strange feature of these successive periods is a sudden raid of northerners that breaks through to the south of Europe in the midst of the most flourishing age, and leaves no permanent trace. In 1527 AD, the raid on Rome and its horrible sacking by the Germans under the Constable de Bourbon, see Germans on diagram, was the greatest blow the city received since Totila. As Gibbon says, the ravages of the barbarians, whom Alaric had led from the banks of the Danube, were less destructive than the hostiles exercised by the troops of Charles V. In 390 BC, the Celts laid Rome waste with fire and sword, and in 279, they largely plundered Greece, see Celts in diagram, in the late Minoan second period, or 1500 BC, was a great catastrophe for the destruction of the palace of Knossos, apparently by barbarians, who nevertheless did not interrupt the general culture. The middle Minoan II period, about the 12th Egyptian dynasty, or 3300 BC, is cut short by a general catastrophe, which does not hinder the immediate resumption of the civilization by building the second palace. Evans, S.A. Declassification. Thus, in four successive periods, that is so far back as our detailed knowledge extends, we see that southern Europe, at its brightest, has been suddenly clouded by a northern storm which has left no permanent change. The principal conqueror of each period has arisen at the same phase. In period 8, Napoleon is marked with N below the line, between literature and mechanics. In period 7, Caesar, marked C, is in the same position. In period 6, Ramesu II, R, comes at L and M in the same connection. In period 5, Sinusert III, S, the main Egyptian conqueror in that period, coincides with L. With regard to the beginning and end of each period, the exact assignment is difficult, as the mixture of the incoming race is usually gradual, extending over a century or more. Hence it is not surprising, if we have a couple of centuries variation in the period of growth before the phase of sculpture, the rather longer interval between the 5th and 6th civilizations 
is seen to be due to the slower development of the sixth, the fifth ending normally. On the other hand, the short interval between the sixth and seventh is seen to be due to the violent end of the sixth, cutting off entirely the normal four centuries or so of slow decay after the maximum of wealth was attained. Thus the study of the diagram shows clearly what were the exact seats of the irregularities of the periods. 31. Stages of Government Forms of government are left to the last, as a regulation of daily affairs, and the repression of wrong is of little meaning in civilization, when compared with the great formative interests of man's mind, whose phases we have studied. It is true that man thinks and talks much about government in all ages, but then the concern of man is no measure of the real value of a subject, as appears by his perennial interest in gambling, which now occupies a large part of the printing in this country. So also government is of great concern, but of little import. Constitutional history is a barren figment compared with the permanent value of art, literature, science or economics. What man does is the essential in each civilization, how he advances in capacities and what he bequeaths to future ages. The relations between the different classes of a country are merely a subsidiary. England, France and Russia will be remembered by Newton, Pasteur and Mendeleev, when all their forms of government are forgotten. At every invasion by the new papal, which, as we have seen, is a necessary foundation of a new period of civilization, there must be strong personal rule. The holding together of the invaders, the decisive subjection of the invaded, the strife of the fusion of peoples, all require an autocracy of greater or less scope. This period lasts during four to six centuries. The next stage is an oligarchy, when leadership is still essential, but the unity of the country can be maintained by law instead of autocracy. This stage varies in length. In Greece and Rome it was about four centuries, in medieval Europe about five or six centuries. Then gradually the transformation to a democracy takes place, beginning about the great phase of literature in Greece, Rome and modern Europe. During this time of about four centuries, wealth, that is, the accumulated capital of facilities, continues to increase. When democracy has attained full power, the majority without capital necessarily ate up the capital of the minority, and the civilization steadily decays until the inferior population is swept away to make room for a fitter people. The consumption of all the resources of the Roman Empire from the second century when democracy was dominant until the Gothic kingdom arose on its ruin is a best-known example in detail, such as a regular connection of the forms of government or the relation of classes which is inherent in the conditions of the revolutions of civilization. Section 7 of The Revolutions of Civilization by Flinders Petrie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 7 Conditions of Civilization. 32. Advance through strife. In another point of view, the periods of civilization bear a fresh meaning. There is no advance without strife. Man must strive with nature or with man, if he is not to fall back and degenerate. The harder a nation strives, the more capable it will be. This is not only the slow result of selection, but it is the immediate result in each individual, produced by the attitude of his mind. The northern nations, accustomed to striving against climate, thrive vastly when they get into easier countries, until their tone is left down to their conditions. Hence almost all migration is from colder to warmer climates, and within the same country, as in England at present, there is a steady flow of families pushing south. This necessity of striving implies a rapid advance during the centuries after an invasion. There is the whole organization of the new period to be evolved by continuous strife of ideas and personalities. There is a new civilization to be evolved by striving of ideals until a definite platform is reached. So soon as each subject loses its archaism and reaches a full freedom of expression, there is no more strife with difficulties and uncertainties of mode. Then strife being ended, decay sets in shortly after. Further, the accumulation of the facilities of life, or capital in every form, diminishes the need for striving. There is so much the less worth striving for, there is so much more to enjoy that strife. Hence the easier life is rendered, the more easy is decay and degeneration. The maximum of wealth must inevitably lead to the downfall. 33. Causes of Period 
We have now seen how general is the regular recurrence of civilization in all countries that we have examined, and how constant is the order of its phases. Another question remains to us. Why is this period so far regular? What determines the spring, summer, and autumn of the great year? The first most obvious causes would be periodical changes of climate. The American expedition to Turkestan has brought to light regular cycles of wet and dry climate there, and Mr. Huntington has pointed out the effects of such cycles of climate in Western Asia and Greece. Royal Geographical Society, 26, May 1910 It is clear that such changes have an effect in precipitating upon the richer lands the pastoral races, who live on lands too dry for agriculture. We find an age of famines along with such movements and continuing after them. The Hyksos movement from the Arabian plains was followed by famine in Syria, and then seven years famine in Egypt. The Arab movement started from a great famine in AD 600, followed by famines during four centuries, in 866, 873, 928, 929, 969, 970, 1025, 1055, 1065, yearly to 1072, and then some sporadic famines in 1201, 1264, 1295. These were caused by the low Nile in Egypt, which implies a short supply in Abyssinia. Thus the increased dryness does accompany an age of migration and may be one cause for it. But that would not account for the regular phases already described, nor can it account for a race keeping to its own phase when it has passed into a country of a different phase as we have noticed. There may be a normal rate of change from stage to stage produced by the process of the human mind. Each generation may average a certain extent of change, as each year averages a certain amount of growth or decay in the body. Yet against this, as an entire cause, there is the alteration in the closeness of the phases. The different activities were grouped much more closely together in early times. They are by now separated by some generations each. This may imply that each subject is more elaborately developed as it comes forward and absorbs all the best intellect for a longer time and so postpones the rise of the next subject. There is, however, another possible cause of the length of period. The rise of the new civilization is conditioned by migration of a different people. That is to say, it arises from a mixture of two different stocks. That effect of mixture cannot take place all at once. There are barriers of antipathy, barriers of creed, barriers of social standing, but every barrier to race fusion gives way in time, when two races are in contact. Even if every marriage in the first generation was a mixed one, that would only give two elements of the native fusion to each child, and what seems to be needed is an ancestry of all the elements of two different races completely intermingled to produce a new era of activities. Now if generations average thirty years, we may take it that each man has ten ancestors a century ago, apart from related marriages. Hence each man has a million ancestors in six centuries. 10 millions in 7 centuries, 100 millions in 8 centuries. Thus, apart from related marriages, 7 or 8 centuries of mixture of two races ensures that in any ordinary sized country, the full maximum number of different ancestors are blended, and every strain of one race has crossed with every strain of the other. This is the period of greatest ability, beginning almost 8 centuries after the mixture and lasting for 4 or 5 centuries in different subjects. The extension of the time may well balance the delay in mixture due to related marriages. Thus we may say that the complete crossing of two races produces the maximum of ability, and that, from that point, repeated generations diminish the ability. This may well be the basal cause of the length of period which we have noticed, as it well accords with it in the time required. But probably each of the other causes before noted may bear a part. For instance, a dry period and famine may precipitate a migration which cuts short a civilization, as in period 6. 34. The future. And what of the future? We have at last a fairly constant view of the whole system of civilization, its causes of development, its stages of growth and decay. How far can that suggest the future? This is by no means a fatalist view for there is much difference between an unhealthy and a healthy civilization, as much to care for and strive for, as there is between a man worn out by middle life and one who is vigorous and useful to a green old age. If we look at the diagram of all the stages, figure 57, 
we see that the winding apart of the stages means that wealth of improvements can be accumulated later in each stage, and the maximal wealth in Europe promises in our own stage to reach to near the end of our period, when an entire mixture with another race will be requisite. We do not see any tendency to shorten the stage of growth in successive periods. That may be because it is conditioned by complete crossing of the two stocks, as we have noticed. So that the production of a new European art and its subsequent activities cannot be expected for many centuries. But are not the conditions of the world so radically altered that no past phenomena will be repeated again? The mixture of race going on in many countries at present will tend to fuse the whole world, owing to the case of communication which has never existed before. In a few centuries, will not the people of every country be blended and be alike? Hardly so, as the conditions of climate will always make men black or white. The conditions of the countries will always separate pastoral, agricultural, and manufacturing communities. The present rate of spread is the effect of a sudden facility. It will tend to diminish, as suitable conditions are found and established, and a more stable adjustment of population will arise in future. It is parallel to the great diffusion which must have taken place on the development of shipping. Yet the view becomes really grasped that the source of every civilization has lain in race mixture. It may be that eugenics will, in some future civilization, carefully segregate fine races and prohibit continual mixture until they have a distinct type, which will start a new civilization when transplanted. The future progress of man may depend as much on isolation to establish a type as on fusion of types when established. End of section 7 and end of The Revolutions of Civilization 